1944, as World War II was raging, Americans in the Northwest began seeing and hearing things they couldn't explain. A father and son set off on an early morning fishing trip. As they reached the middle of the lake, they caught sight of something flying overhead. When they raced into the woods to follow it, all they found was a small fire. A young mother was putting her infant child to bed when a flash, then a blast, shook her house. When she peered out into the darkness, she saw nothing. What was happening? Authorities were soon piecing together an incredible story. Balloons of unknown origin were descending across the West. On December 6, 1944, in Thermopolis, Wyoming. Five days later, in Kalispell, Montana. The next week, outside Marshall, Alaska. Robert Mickish is an historian. He investigated the balloon story for over 30 years. In Wyoming and Montana, they began discovering quantities. Not really sure what's happening or what these balloons are for or particularly where they're coming from. It was a mystery. Since sightings were concentrated in the Northwest, Authorities believed that someone was launching the balloons from a West Coast beach. But why? The answer to that question quickly became clear. The balloons were carrying bombs. The United States was under attack. The military captured a number of balloons intact and even made a classified film about them. These images, taken by an Air Force cameraman of an actual balloon bomb in flight, have never before been televised. Investigators examined these balloons for clues to their origin. They discovered strange mechanical devices, probably some sort of guidance system. They also found bags filled with sand, no doubt used as ballast. And they made one more startling discovery. Tucked inside one of the balloons was a piece of paper. It was an inspection tag written in Japanese. Were the balloons coming from Japan? Impossible. A balloon could never survive the flight from Japan over 5,000 miles across the Pacific all the way to North America. Or could it? Fire! We were, of course, at war with Japan. American forces were coming ashore in the Pacific. Some of the fiercest combat of the war was underway. Back in the States, the U.S. government had forcibly moved thousands of Japanese Americans into internment camps. The military now suspected that Japanese agents were operating a balloon launch site from inside one of the camps. The military mounted countermeasures. Hundreds of planes took to the air to stop incoming balloons. Anti-aircraft guns fired at them from the ground. The government also wanted to keep news of the balloons from reaching the enemy. So a decision was made to suppress the story. The Office of Censorship issued a secret request to newspapers and radio stations to keep all reports about balloon sightings out of the news. The FBI 
contacted the news media, told them that what you are reporting is true, but thank you for keeping it under wraps because the only way the enemy is going to find out about it is what you print in your newspaper and what you put on your radio. By now, the Army had begun studying the balloons. As engineers began dissecting the control units, samples of the sand were sent to the United States Geological Survey. military wanted the geologists to tell them where the sand came from. If the balloons were being launched from a hidden U.S. beach, maybe the sand could lead them to it. The assignment was mind-boggling. This sand could have come from any beach in the world. Was it even possible to determine which one? Mark Van Balen is a geologist at Harvard University. He studied the work of the balloon bomb scientists. The survey geologists were faced with a rather difficult and unusual assignment. The interesting thing about sand is that there are many different types of grains, and each grain has its own message. Sand starts out as rock. Over time, Wind and rain break down mountains into boulders and smaller particles. These grains get carried by rivers to nearby beaches. No two sands contain exactly the same mix of minerals. To find where the balloon sand was coming from, the geologists had to determine what it was made of. They first sorted the grains into piles of similar color and texture. Some grains were translucent. These could be studied under the polarizing microscope. The range of colors gives clues as to their mineral content. also found microscopic animal and plant fossils in the sand. Their shapes are clues to their place of origin. While the geologists studied the sand, engineers studied the balloons. Incredibly, they were made entirely of rice paper, glued together with vegetable paste. It was so bizarre from other weapon systems that were being devised. We're talking about B-29 super fortresses. We're talking about airplanes uh, reaching supersonic speeds or touching upon it. And yet here is a weapon system that is designed primarily and solely to be carried to the enemy in a paper bag. But the paper bags were guided by an ingenious delivery system and the engineers had now figured it out. Upon release, the balloons floated upward. As the sun heated the balloon, it would expand and rise. But if it expanded too much, it could burst. So a valve would open, releasing excess pressure. As night fell and the balloon cooled, it would descend. But if it dropped too much, it could crash. To prevent this, an altimeter would close a switch, igniting a charge. The blast released a pair of sandbags, lightening the load. When all the sandbags had been released, a final charge would release the bomb. Now that they understood how the balloons flew, the engineers were asking another question. Why did the balloons carry so many sandbags, enough to travel for several days and nights, if they were coming from the U.S.? Because they weren't coming from the U.S. The balloons were coming from Japan. Japan. 
the Japanese had discovered a weather phenomenon unknown to the Americans. Over the Pacific, high in the atmosphere, were fast-moving winds that could quickly carry a balloon across. We now know these winds as the jet stream. Japan discovered the jet stream when they discovered that contrary to the belief that some of the highest uh, winds were, oh, 60 or 70 miles an hour, there was what was we know now as the jet stream, and that ranged in air speeds up to uh, 200 miles an hour. So they discovered what uh, would normally take six to eight days of travel of a balloon, which would be pretty testy. They could do this in about 33 hours. By now, the geologists had completed their study of the balloon sand. They next had to compare the sand with the known geology of Japan. If the sand could be traced to a specific region, that might help them pinpoint the balloon launch sites. Before the war, Japanese geologists had spent decades mapping their country's rock deposits. Those maps would soon prove invaluable. As it turned out, the sand was unusual, not only for what it contained, but for what it did not. For instance, it contained no granite, one of the most common rock types on Earth. It also had no coral fragments. But it did have high concentrations of some rare volcanic minerals. These were important clues. The lack of coral meant that all beaches below the 35th parallel could be ruled out. Coral is almost always found in the warm waters that wash these beaches. The absence of granite in the sand eliminated other beaches. The final clue came from the microscopic plants and animals. It turned out that the ones found in the balloon sand had been found before by a French geological expedition to Japan in the year 1889. The location of the find was a beach named Ichinomaya. Photo reconnaissance planes were sent out to search for launch sites. They returned with pictures of what appeared to be partially inflated balloons and hydrogen generators. The geologists had been right. From a few grains of sand, they had found the launch sites. American B-29s bombed the area, destroying two hydrogen plants supplying the balloons. As suddenly as they had appeared, the balloons stopped coming. A few weeks later, in Oregon, the Reverend Archie Mitchell and his wife Elsie took a group of children out for a day of hiking. Mrs. Mitchell and the children got out of the car and ran off toward the woods, while Mr. Mitchell parked nearby. One of the children soon spotted a strange object. It was an unexploded balloon bomb. Mrs. Mitchell called to her husband. What happened next is unknown. All five children and Mrs. Mitchell were killed instantly. They became the only Americans on the U.S. mainland killed by an enemy during World War II. The tragedy forced the War Department to rescind the news blackout. Stories soon appeared alerting people to the danger. But by this point, it didn't matter there would be no more balloons. The bombing raids had done their job, as had the news blackout. With no evidence of success and their factories damaged, the Japanese had already abandoned the balloon bomb offensive. 
Mrs. Mitchell and the children were probably killed by one of the last bombs to arrive. 